The Tom Woods Show, episode 1834. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Very pleased to be joined by James Dellingpole, who is the author of numerous books, fiction and nonfiction. Podcaster, executive editor for Breitbart London, has written for a great many publications, including the Daily Mail, Daily Express, The Times, The Daily Telegraph, and The Spectator. And frankly, I just wanted to talk to him and see where the conversation goes. I I know he is as demoralized about what's going on with the COVID restrictions as I am, and he just has a unique way of putting it. And plus, I just wanted to get to know him. So James, welcome to the show. Tom, it's great to be on the show. I was just starting to tell you before we started recording, and then I said, doggone it, why am I telling you this instead of recording this, making it part of the show? When I reached out to invite you onto the program, I thought, I want to have James on because of who he is and because I've read his stuff over the years and I like him. Sometimes I invite people on because they wrote some article that I find interesting or a book or whatever. But in this case, it was just that you're you. So we could talk about almost anything, but yet... For some reason lately, all I can talk about is the the virus insanity. And I, I think back to my episodes, let's say around April of 2020, in which I'm apologetically saying to my audience, all right, listen, all right, what's one more episode dealing with this virus thing, but I promise I'll have some other topics. And here I am in February 2021, and I'm still talking about it. But it's because it's abs- it's like... It's nothing you could have anticipated. It's so crazy. And over where you are, I think it's even worse, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Tom, the reason that you you talk about this is because it is the only story in town. I mean, everything, everything connects to this coronavirus thing. You know, you can expand outwards into things like Bitcoin and Robin Hood, and you can talk about, I don't know, um, the Trump presidency. Everything is connected with with the coronavirus story because I've actually hardened a lot. You, you, You talked about what you were talking about in April 2020. I've become much more hardcore on this. I think that this is basically no worse than a bad flu year at best. I mean, worst case scenario, which has been transformed into a world destroying, economy destroying, apocalyptic event after which our lives are probably going to be unrecognizable. We're probably never going to get our old lives back. It has been an unmitigated disaster. And the problem is it's a man-made disaster. It's a disaster which has been created by a, I suppose Trump would call them globalists. It's, it's a cabal. It's, it's the Chinese Communist Party. It's, it's big tech. It's the, uh, the legacy media. It's the Democrats. It's the swamp. The swamp have created this monster and it didn't need to happen. This is entirely artificial. Are you with me on that one? I couldn't agree more. Except the the slight amendment, friendly amendment I'll offer is that it's also a lot of the Republicans. It's actually a, a really small sliver of them who are really bold about this. Most of them are cowering. Most of them are adopting the standard view. It's extremely disappointing. I would never, ever let the Republicans... uh, The the GOP is completely... It's like the Conservative Party in the UK. The Conservatives are completely dead to me. I mean, I I, I would not describe myself as a Conservative anymore for fear of being associated with this absolute shit show that is currently in charge of, of my country. But I think it's the same across the world. People are looking around at their, at their political representatives and saying to themselves... How did I get people this useless in charge of my life? I mean, I, I thought these guys were supposed to be better than that. And they have been absolutely hopeless in the face of this, this global conspiracy, because I, I think that's what it is. I mean, they didn't, these guys didn't sit around a table planning it, but it's a kind of convergence of interests, let's say. And their interests lie in turning us all into slaves of this sort of globalist new world order. At the same time, I'm sure over there, the reach of Dr. Anthony Fauci, I'm sure goes well beyond the borders of the United States. I'm sorry to report he's one of our worst exports. But Dr. Fauci, though. Dr. Evil. He is definitely, he is, I think he's the most evil person with doctor in front of his name at the moment. Oh, wow. Okay. And this goes back 
to, I mean, he was implicated in a lot of dodgy stuff in the AIDS era. So he goes right back. So he actually helped destroy my sex life in the 1980s. Because you remember, I mean, you're a bit younger than me, aren't you, Tom? I, I was at university when sort of AIDS really took off. And there was this government-sponsored lie campaign. It was government propaganda. And it said, AIDS, don't die of ignorance. And actually what the government, this is a, this is a precursor to coronavirus. The, the government was lying to us about the threat. I mean, it clearly wrecked havoc in the, in the gay community. But if you were a, a heterosexual, like I was, um, am, um, it wasn't really going to make much of a difference. And yet we were frightened into not having sex because we were told that everyone was in danger. Yeah, I've, I've thought of, about that parallel too. I mean, obviously the mode of transmission is different, but the general principle of claiming or at least strongly insinuating that everybody is at risk, as, as they've done with this thing. They'll, they'll admit yes. that older people are more likely to get it, but they'll constantly say, oh, he was 41 and in perfect health. I mean, what is the point of saying that if not to give us the impression that we're all equally at risk? So as I've said about the AIDS thing, at the time, they were trying to say AIDS is uh, not just a homosexual disease. Okay, and, and yes, it's possible that you could get it, but the thing is, because they say anybody could get it. The way I've put it, the way some of my friends put it, yeah, anybody could also get struck and killed by a passing horse at the Kentucky Derby. Anybody could. But if you don't do certain things, probably you won't. Well, the reason I bring up Fauci, and by the way, if Fauci was considered a villain by gay activists at the time, but now, since for some reason gay activists have no self-respect, they don't want to defend themselves anymore, now they're just on board with Fauci, like they just kissed and made up, I guess. It's like nothing ever happened. But the reason I brought up Fauci is that in 2021, we have started to hear him use a phrase that he did not use, resolutely did not use throughout 2020, which is back to normal. Everybody else has been saying, oh, we're, we may never get back to normal. You'll never be able to do X or Y or Z. But he's been saying, well, we should be able to get back to something like normal by the fall or whatever. He's been using that phrase that he hadn't used last year. I think that's significant. Yeah, yeah. The whole We are being played the whole time. I tell, I tell you the, the thing that really signaled to me, and this was, this was actually quite early on, that this is what signaled to me that this is a massive scam, and that was hydroxychloroquine. Now, I wrote about hydroxychloroquine and its effects in treating coronavirus really quite early on. And then I got, I got kind of shut down. There was this massive campaign by all the tech companies. Whenever you mentioned hydroxychloroquine, you were booted off social media. I, I think I got my, my account suspended once for just, just for mentioning that this drug, this cheap, generic, available drug, for pointing out that this had been shown to be effective in France, in the, um, the Zelenko Protocol in New York. And yet suddenly this was anathema. You could not say this. Now, why was this, given that we now know, I mean, given that, that recently that various medical associations have re reversed their position and admitted that hydroxychloroquine is effective after all. So why did we have this period of about nine months where they were trying to stop it being used? I think it was banned in many countries. Well, it was because the... Big Pharma, and beyond Big Pharma, this this the, the kind of the what you might call the COVID industrial complex. They did not want a cheap, readily available cure to be available because they wanted to push through these vaccines. These vaccines, which aren't even vaccines, they don't actually stop you apparently transmitting the disease or catching the disease. They just make your symptoms a bit milder. And they've got all these terrible side effects. This is, I am sometimes left gasping in disbelief at what is happening to us, what's happening to our culture. And the failure, actually, of so many of my contemporaries, my peers in, in the media to hold governments to account, to hold the medical establishment to account, to do their basic bloody job. Most people are just surrendering to this rampaging behemoth, which seems hell-bent on stealing away everything of value within our civilization. It's extraordinary. Didn't you think that certainly by now, but I thought months and months ago, there would be a huge number of people saying, this is ridiculous. Obviously, we have to assess risk for ourselves. But this obviously, you 
what is the point of living after all? If you're going to take away all the things that make life worth living, what is the point of preserving my life? Partly it's that it's a couple of things. Number one is that people are afraid of being called names, which is why they don't say a lot of things that are on their minds. But secondly, it's that it's some kind of a Stockholm syndrome effect. I don't know what's going on, but I don't know if it's they're taught obedience in school or they think that people in white coats with clipboards just automatically have the answer. I don't know, but it's just amazing people won't stand up for their own lives. What will you stand up for? What would you stand up for? Yeah, I'm not as prolific as you. I, I, I wish I could have the discipline to sit down and write lots of best-selling books. I was going to write a book last year and I was planning it in my head. And it was going to be called A Perfect Storm of Stupid because I wanted to describe all the different factors that went into creating this insane... Oh, you and I should have written that together. It would have taken half the burden off of both of us because that needs to be done. <laughs> Listen, the book the book should still... I'm, I'm very interested in why things happen. Like when I, I wrote a book a few years ago called Watermelons, which was about about global warming and climate change. And it, and it set out to answer the, the question, okay, if climate change is not a problem, why would so many people think it was? Why would so many institutions, why would so many scientists, why would so many politicians all believe that it is a problem and why would they act on it? And in the same way, I look at what's going on now and I think, why are they doing this? How did it happen? How did they get away with it? Well, Okay, so we've got various factors. We've got obviously the Great Reset, the technocratic plan for kind of um, for turning us all into serfs of this new technocratic elite, and you've got the World Economic Forum preaching that. You've got the United Nations preaching that in the form of Agenda 2030 and so on. And then you've got the Chinese Communist Party and so on. But what was it that made us culturally susceptible to this? And you've got various things, haven't you? You've got the dumbing down of our education system. Not only do younger generations not know stuff, they don't know basic facts, they don't know their history, they can't do maths, they, can't, they can barely string a sentence together. They cannot think critically. So they cannot assess a situation and form an intelligent view. So that's, that's part of the problem. But then you've got, I mean, I suppose every generation says this, that... that the politicians of today are not nearly in the league of, of the politicians of old. Right? I mean, that, that may be a factor. What else? You've got, in a way, the global warming thing was a dry run for all this, that, that people had been programmed since, uh, when was um, the Rio Earth Summit? was in 1991, I think it was. I blocked that out of my mind, but... <laughs> yeah, so... We're talking about three decades of relentless propaganda in which people have been told, and they've been taught this at schools, etc., by, by science teachers who really should know better, but the science teachers don't because they're stupid too. They've been told that the world is going to hell and it's kind of all our fault because of our selfishness and greed and stupidity and so on, we have allowed the planet to die. And, and we need to take radical action. We need to readjust our lifestyles. We need to lead, live more sustainably. We need to learn to do with less and so on. Well, you see the parallel between what we were being urged to do with climate change and what we're being urged to do now with coronavirus. And the reason for that is very simple because they are one and the same thing. The same people who are pushing the climate scare narrative are now pushing the coronavirus narrative, the coronavirus scare narrative, that we must take it seriously. We must act now. It's, it's too important to delay. So we are, you and I and people like us are outliers. We're like, I mean, I sometimes wonder why it is that, you know, the, 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 I'm, I'm flattered that you wanted to talk to me. And, and, and I guess one of the reasons is that I'm, I'm a sort of maverick who really doesn't care about losing all his friends by, by, by speaking unpalatable truths. It doesn't bother me. There's a, there's a phenomenon. Somebody once told me this. I, I was talking to this, um, uh, a farmer from the north of England, and uh, he keeps sheep. And he told me that in every flock of sheep, there is a mad sheep, the mad sheep that doesn't do what all the other sheep do. And, and the purpose of the mad sheep is this. 
Say there is a, say that the whole of the field gets covered in, in snow and all the familiar landmarks disappear. The mad sheep who has previously been completely useless because he's, you know, he, he won't do all the sheep things that the other sheep do, he won't fit in, suddenly does some crazy things like climbs onto what's left of a wall and poking above the snow and can recognize the way out. The mad sheep suddenly becomes useful. And I think I'm a mad sheep and maybe you're a mad sheep too. And we can see this stuff that the most of the flock cannot see to their detriment because they're going to get slaughtered. Hey, folks, we're going to take a quick minute to thank our sponsor, Skillshare. And I'm going to ask you to do something out of the ordinary today. You've heard me promote Skillshare over and over again, but I want you to take action today. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative people that offers classes, little bite-sized classes, super specific to help you improve in some area, learn something, make yourself more marketable, make yourself a more indispensable employee, possibly help you start your own business. It is an astonishingly wide array of offerings that you'll find, thousands and thousands of them at Skillshare, and one membership gets you access to all of it. Everything from marketing and productivity to fine art, music, music production, film and video, animation, creative writing, photography, graphic design, freelance and entrepreneurship, web development, crafts, an unbelievable array of things. Now, because I myself do occasional consulting work on the side and I never really know what I should be charging for it, I benefited from Peggy Dean's class, Pricing Your Work, How to Value Your Work as a Freelancer. Expand your horizons with something new or get really, really good at something you already enjoy. And Skillshare is super affordable too. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash Woods and get a free trial of premium membership. That's Skillshare.com slash Woods to get a free trial of premium membership. Well, in this situation, people want to know, all right, listen, I, you're preaching to the choir. I hear you. I agree. I know. And the question is, what comes next? Now, in the United States, the benefit of our federal system, such as it is, is that there are some places where half normal life has resumed. And so therefore, those places have to be smeared, they have to be lied about, or they have to be ignored. Now, lately, it's ignored because Florida is actually doing pretty well, especially compared to the heavily locked down states. Florida has as you, I'm sure you know from what you've heard about people retiring in Florida, a very old population, one of the oldest in America. So we should be getting absolutely slaughtered in the numbers by a place like California, which has one of the youngest populations. But actually, right now, as of this moment, right now, the hospitalizations, the deaths are all better for Florida. And in terms of overall, California has been climbing the past few months and catching up to Florida. Things are semi-normal here in that I had tickets to a concert next week. I can't go because I'm because I'm traveling because like a normal person and I can't go. So I'm giving the tickets away. I've got a, tickets to another concert the next month. I've been to three plays over the past couple of months. I mean, these are things that normal people do. You can go to a bar. You can sit at the bar. You can drink. So maybe one thing we can do is people can move to where there's some rationality because not only is that good for you, it's good for that place because you'll have enough voters there that you can't get some bozo in who'll take it away from you. Yeah. So you you actually live in in Florida? I do. Because I have to say I'm I envy you greatly. I've been looking across Florida thinking uh, DeSantis what a, what a, what a fantastic guy to have in charge of your your state. Yeah. I mean it's between at the moment it's between South Dakota and Florida and I'm thinking well Florida has got nice sea and uh, I mean too many sharks for my liking but uh, and it's a bit flat. It's a bit flat. But then I think the winters in South Dakota are pretty grim. They're, yes, they're pretty brutal. Yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty brutal. But like almost anywhere in the world is looking more attractive than my country at the moment. I mean, you've, you've heard about the latest insanity, haven't you? The, uh, we've got this health secretary who's this power crazed loon called Matt Hancock. And Matt Hancock has just made this new rule whereby. If you travel to a red list country, and, and red list countries include, you know, I mean, holiday destinations like the Seychelles, um, like Mauritius, but also Portugal. Portugal, I mean, you, you know, one of the most popular hol- holiday destinations in the UK. People have people have got second homes there. People people retire there, but they retire to Florida. Now, if you go to Florida, I'm oh, sorry, if you go if you go to um, Portugal. You have to, when you return to the UK, 
you have to spend £1,750, £1,750 and 10 days in a quarantine hotel. So you're, you're, you're kept in a room. You cannot leave your room. You are isolated. It's like, it's like solitary confinement. You're kept in this grim hotel, presumably eating really quite shit food. And you, you have to have two invasive swabs. And if you try and evade this process, if you try, if you lie about where you've been, Hancock has decreed that you should get a 10-year, 10-year jail sentence. That is more than you get for incest or molesting a child of 14. I mean, or, or, or carrying a loaded gun, which of course is, is illegal in this country. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but can you imagine what, what, what a sort of disproportionate response it is to punish people with a 10-year a jail sentence for lying about where they've been on holiday? It's crazy. The world has gone mad. Yeah, it has gone mad. And so again, how do you, people are giving up things that they love. That makes it sound like trivial, but it's not. I mean, we can talk about people burning through their savings. We can talk about people missing cancer screenings and all that. But but things that give your life meaning are not trivial. You know, your, your great Lord Sumption said something like, human happiness is not an optional extra. You know, it is part of the whole point of existing. So in Florida, I'm not giving up things that I enjoy. I mean, I, I want live music back and I want more theater back. But in general, I'm able to do what I want. And these are people who, I can't understand why there are things in life that you love so much. And you can see there are places in the world where people are still doing them to apparently no ill effect. Why does that not make you curious? Why are you not scouring the internet for evidence to see if maybe it's not as bad as they say? Why instead are people almost eager for bad news? Again, I, these are rhetorical questions because I, at this point, I feel like I don't even belong to the same species as these people. In fact, you said recently, you, you said something like, you don't think you can be friends anymore with people who have bought into this. And I hate to be one of these people who makes all of life political, but since this is the biggest thing that's ever happened in my life and I hope ever will happen, I actually agree with that. I, I don't see how I could, honestly, it would be like somebody who is actively abetting an atrocity. How could I be friends with that person? Yeah, Tom, it, it, I tell you what, for most of, I mean, this sounds like a description, another description of a world that we're, that is completely vanished. But I, I would say for the first, certainly the first half of my life, we used to speculate because, because we, you know, I was born 20 years after the end of the end of the Second World War. So it was, my, you know, a lot of my teachers had fought in the Second World War. A lot of the movies we watched were about World War II and stuff. So we often used to used to look at World War II and and how we would have responded in a given situation. And one of the great tests, um, and I used to I used to talk about this with one of my my Jewish friends. We we used to divide our friends up into those who would have sheltered Anne Frank in their attic, and those who would have turned her away, or or even even shopped her to the authorities. And this was our kind of uh, our litmus test. And another one, I suppose, would be: Had you been in France with the you know, when the Germans invaded, would you have been a collaborator? Would you would you have worked for the Vichy regime, or would you have been a resistant? And what we know about the French resistance is that there were actually very very few of them. Most most some people collaborated, some people went along to get along. I think that from the experience of most people was they just just tried to stay alive as best they could. But a few brave ones, probably a very small portion of, of, of the population, actually risked their lives. They fought the Germans. They did all sorts of things, brave things, and often often died for it. Well, I look at my friends now. I look at, look at the journalists. I look at my, you know, my colleagues. I look at almost everyone in my country. And I realize you wouldn't just have gone along to get along. You would actively have collaborated with the enemy like you're doing now. You'd be shopping people to the police for having illegal meetings with friends. I mean, the amount of snitching, okay, maybe another comparison is the Stasi in East Germany behind the Iron Curtain. A lot of people are snitching on, on, on their neighbors for failing to observe the government's draconian codes. It's ridiculous. We should be we should be fighting tyranny, not indulging it and, and endorsing it. But I'm afraid that's what most people are doing. And I, I find it very, very difficult to forgive 
those of my friends who are not resisting. This is the biggest test of our lifetimes. I mean, the biggest test that that anyone living is facing. I mean, I would say it's even even greater than the Second World War because at least in the Second World War, the battle lines were drawn between you know good and evil. It was fairly obvious the Germans are the bad guys. The evil that is that is enveloping the world now is as bad as the Nazis, except um, uh, except kind of worse. I mean, because because what's happening now genuinely could be the end of Western civilization. I would say this is what I fear that unless we resist, it's going to be game over. And yet so many people are not resisting. What is, um, oh, now I can't think of his name. The the guy we associate with Brexit. Why am I not, not thinking of his name? What, Farage? Uh, yes, yes. What is he up to on this? He's been absolutely useless. He's completely shit the bed, I'm afraid. Really? Yeah, yeah. He's been absolutely bloody useless. I'm so, so disappointed. And people say, Oh, well, he fought a good fight over Brexit. Yeah, okay. Well, in that case, if you're not capable of fighting the next big thing, then why don't you retire and shut up? But don't appear on radio shows and stuff trying to pretend that you're still relevant because you're not. He's wet the bed on COVID. He's wet the bed on on, on the vaccines. He hasn't fought back at all. He hasn't acknowledged the tyranny that is being that is being forced on us. And I'm I, I think that's sad. In fact, there are Again, our parliamentarians have been almost to a man and woman have been absolutely useless. They have not resisted. Even people that you would have thought of as the 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 the, the so-called Spartans, the people within the Conservative Party who fought tooth and nail for the purest, hardest Brexit, they've been noticeable by their absence. It, it, it's all the people who, who who should be fighting this battle have fled the field. That's unbelievable. Now, as I say, in in our country. Yeah, it's it's DeSantis in Florida, and I I don't want to diminish what he's done. And we have Christy Nome in in South Dakota, uh, but DeSantis is pretty good because he actually knows the science. You can talk to him, and he'll say, "Oh yeah, there was that uh, contact tracing study in Iceland back in April that de- dealt with schools." Like he knows this off the top of his head. He knows it. Yeah. So he's standing up to these people, which is pretty good. But other than that, it's it's. It's like maybe a few radio hosts who are scattered with no leadership. With it's just very, very lonely fight. And I thought also, I thought maybe and this goes to show how how uh, I should never ever underestimate these people because I can always estimate them even less. Because I should never overestimate them because they they don't deserve it. The Hollywood people, the the uh, celebrities. I thought well maybe they'll be good for something. Because eventually they're going to get tired of not making money and not making movies. And eventually they're going to declare that, well, look, we've done everything we possibly can. We've all made ridiculous sacrifices. We can't indefinitely turn our lives off. We all know that. So good luck, but we're going to resume our lives. They're not even good enough to do that. Yeah. I thought those people, right, the selfish, you know, people who they want the whole world to know that they're for Black Lives Matter and every fashionable opinion, they, they just need attention. But they, I thought, geez, they also need the spotlight. They got to get back in the movies and stuff. No, apparently they're they're content to just burn through their savings. Like, okay, all right. So is there anything? So there's no leadership. Uh, people we thought we could count on, we can't count on. There's got to be something we can do. I mean, as I say, I'm glad I live in Florida. If I didn't, I would be moving here. That is a guarantee. I would be moving here. I don't know what else to tell people. Is it, is it a nice place to live? It is. I mean, like any place that has pros and cons. I live sort of close to Orlando, which means we have tourists, but that just means there's life in the place. You know, if people want to come to where you live, that means it's a pretty good place to live. I've lived in many places where nobody wanted to come see me. <laughs> so it's not bad. And also I live near Orlando, which also means that I have an international airport with nonstop flights to all. I can go to Dubai nonstop from Orlando. Now that's not a big deal from Europe, but from the US, that's a big deal. So there, there's a lot to be said. for, And there are a lot of people who think the way we do in Florida, too. That's, yeah, I'm, I'm tempted by that. I, I mean, I like... I'll help you move. When you show up, I'll help you unpack. Yeah, I like the sound of Orlando Airport because I, I hate Miami Airport. Oh, me too. That would really dispirit me. Orlando Airport is a wonderful airport. I, I like it a lot. You don't, have, you don't have any hills there, do you, in, in Florida? Well, I... I haven't really looked, to, to be honest with you. Is, it, is, that a, is that important to you? 
Well, no, I'm thinking about it. Actually, you wouldn't want hills anyway because it's so hot, isn't it, that even if you climbed up a hill, it would be so unpleasant. Yeah, you, you wouldn't get much relief. That would be the problem. <laughs> And I suppose you could always drive. I mean, the the good thing about America, the good thing about the states, is that that you have everything there. So that if I wanted to get some skiing in, I could just drive or fly over to right Colorado or somewhere, couldn't I? Yeah, we and without having to show a passport or get permission or whatever. So that is a big that's deal. the thing. I mean, I'm I'm thinking aloud here because I genuinely do worry that this ain't. Go, I, I, I see no sign in my country that this is going to end. I don't see any will on the part of the current administration. But, but, but the way I think of it is, though, somebody has to crack. There's got to be some country that more or less goes back to normal, even if they give the impression that they're still doing X and Y. Nobody's really observing it and everybody knows they're not. There has to be some country that cracks and then eventually there have to be people who say, why can't we live like that? Country? They seem to be okay. They're not all dead over there. We should, and that's another thing, by the way, we should all be dead. Not, not all of us, but the, all the vulnerable people in Florida. I mean, if, if these measures were so critical to avoid an absolute catastrophe, then Florida shouldn't be like within striking range of other states. We, we should be 50 times, a hundred times worse, maybe a thousand times worse. If we're just kind of marginally different from other states, that is a major indictment of these people. How's that possible? Yeah, yeah. No, I, look, you're you're preaching to the choir here, obviously, Tom. I mean, I mean I've, I've looked at the figures and there are certain things about coronavirus which are very, very clear. One is that lockdowns do not work. They have never worked. This is purely an invention of the CCP. I, 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 I think that is clear. And it was then imposed on, on the West. We were gulled into adopting it by the Chinese through the influence of their, their bots and their tweeters and also by the World Health Organization, which they control. So that's a given. Masks don't work. We know that. We know that because of the Danish, Danish study. We also know from looking at the evidence from around the world that the most draconian responses to coronavirus have often resulted in the worst deaths. So I think Peru was particularly bad. Argentina has not had a good record. So there was no, there was no correlation between government massive clampdowns and success in preventing coronavirus deaths. So, so all, the, all this is, is a given. We also know, I mean, I, I looked at the, the data, for example, for year-on-year -year deaths going back to 1942, adjusted, adjusted for age, the mortality figures, so all deaths. And what you found is that 2020, which you would have thought would have been a horrendous year for deaths, you know, carnage because of this, this deadly plague which has just passed among us, the same number of people adjusted for, for age died in 2020 as died in 2008. And in fact, in every... Every year going back from 2008 to 1942, there had been a higher death toll. Now, I don't remember any of those years from 1942 to 2008, us being forced to wear masks and, and to quarantine ourselves at home, uh, you know, to, uh, under effective house arrest because of this deadly plague. Because, because we didn't, you know, we were, we were bigger than that. We were, we were culturally uh, more confident. We recognized that there were more things to life than cowering at home in fear of being struck down by a disease. So I don't think it's enough that there are examples around the world like Sweden, like Belarus, like, like Brazil. I don't think we can look at those examples and, and say, well, they didn't lock down and look, they did fine. Because the evidence is out there and people don't seem to be interested. They, they, as you say, it, it, it is a form of Stockholm syndrome. People seem to be enjoying... I, I mean, I'll give you an example. There's this young journalist called Tom Harwood. He, I mean, he's a, he's a child. He's, he's not much older than my kids. Um, he's, he's, he's bright. He's, he's articulate. He's, he claims to be a conservative. He's, he writes this sort of influential political gossip column. And today he was busy tweeting out in endorsement of this fascistic policy of Matt, of Matt Hancock, whereby, you know, you, you get 
locked away for twenty for, for ten years if you lie about where you've been on holiday. You know, this this kid was all for these fascistic measures. And that slightly worries me. You think, well, if even the kids are arguing for this stuff, what hope is there for our civilization? Yeah, that's been frustrating because the kids are the ones getting screwed the most by older people, which is so perverse. Now, I'm I'm 48, but I guarantee you, if I were 68 or 78, I would not be telling young people, hey, when I was your age, I got to have all make all these wonderful memories and enjoy life. But in order for you to protect me, you have to basically not live a couple of your years and that you can never get back. You can't have those memories. That is selfish. That's selfish. Not somebody visiting his mother, not somebody taking a vacation for mental health. That's selfish. Telling young people, I mean, time is an irreversible flux. Once it's gone, it does not come back. Telling them they can't have it, that's the selfish thing. But yet the kids, now the one one thing that encouraged me early on was uh, in Connecticut, which is one of the bluest states, they weren't going to let the kids play high school football. And I think they may not have ultimately. And there was a huge rally where the kids were, were chanting, let us play. And I thought, all right, okay, at least they're standing up to authority. That's something. You know, they haven't read my newsletter, but <laughs> that's okay. They, they get the gist of it. That's good. You do see some of that, but now I wonder how many people though there are out there. And I think the number may be larger than you and I suspect who kind of see the world the way we do And they're outwardly conforming because they don't want to be called this or that. And they don't want to be shunned in their communities. But I wonder how many of them, if we could somehow shut up all the evil people just for a minute and say, all right, how many of you in here really just want to get on with your lives? I think more people might raise their hands than we give them credit for. I I share that glimmer of optimism. And we've gotten an historical example of this. You think of how few people it took in the Russian revolution to take over Russia. I mean, extraordinary how small the um, Leninists were, the Bolsheviks, relative to the the Russian populace. And yet they won. And this this is how, I'm not saying we should model ourselves on the Bolsheviks, but what I am saying is that this is how revolutions work their effect. The number of people who are actually at the the sort of the fighting end, the sharp end of things, are very, very small. And I think that the the majority are like a, well, to go back to the sheep, they're they're, they're like a, a herd of sheep. They're waiting for a sign from leaders. And why shouldn't those leaders be us, ultimately? I mean, you know, I, 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 I behave as I would wish others to behave. I don't wear a mask. I flout every government regulation I possibly can. I tell people how stupid I think masks are. I I won't not see my parents. And maybe little by little, our message will get out that we'll shift people. I, I mean, my, my kids are at university and, my, and my, my son sent me some video footage the other day, it's been snowing in in England. Uh, that's one thing you don't probably get to see in Florida. No. And it was he he showed me some. You know, he'd filmed himself and his mates with a, a homemade toboggan going down this slope, full of other people enjoying the snow. And what I was very pleased to see missing from this from this happy winter scene was any police coming along to try and arrest them, which, which has happened, you know. I mean, this, this has been going on. You, there have been scenes where police have arrested people for having snowball fights um, and threatening to find them. And you can be fined up to £10,000 for, the, for these breaches of coronavirus regulations. But it was really good to see that, that at least some kids know how to live a normal life and are determinedly living it in defiance of the government's uh, strictures. Well, I couldn't agree more. James, how can people follow you if they want more of your content? I do this thing called the Delling Pod, which is D-E-L-I-N-G-P-O-D. It's it's on Apple and on YouTube. And I've just started, I've started putting it up on Rumble. I mean, I'm worried about, I don't know whether you have this problem. I'm worried about being canceled. I never know where the where the best place is to put one's audio and visual stuff without it getting taken down. I mean, I think they'll be coming for us sooner or later, won't they? 
Well, it is important to diversify, and I probably need to take my own advice on that. I moved my private group that I have for for my supporting listeners off Facebook as step one for me. But I had a I had a video taken down, only one, only one, and of course it was the most important video I've ever done. It was on the virus, and it was all totally. There's nothing you could contradict in it. Not, not a thing could you contradict in it. And they were desperate. They some they finally did. Facebook finally did a, a fact check of the video, and they were reduced to saying things like, "Well, Woods says that there's been no accounting for the the uh, collateral damage from lockdowns, but in October, the the WHO in October." So you so you mean seven months after this starts, they bother to acknowledge it and you think that's fine? That's exactly my point is it took them seven months to say, you know, there might be some side effects to this. You don't say. Uh, so I even had somebody from YouTube actually write to me because he's in charge of helping right of center people succeed on YouTube. I'm not kidding. And he said, yeah, I'm sorry we had your video taken down. Uh, if I want to put content like that up, I have to have in all four, I'm not kidding you, in all four corners of the screen, I have to say that the CDC does not agree with what I'm saying. I actually might do that for the sheer hilarity of it and then be able to say what I want to say. The sheer hilarity of having that in all four corners, because I consider that a, a, a medal on my chest. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not ashamed of that. Anyway, so Dellingpod is what people should listen to. Dellingpod. Oh, and yeah, have you, have you, I mean, do you use Telegram or any of those? I've, I've just started a group on... Not yet. I, I'm, I'm so behind on this stuff. I'm starting to feel like a boomer already. You know, that uh, uh, the youngsters know all these new platforms and I don't, and I know I need to. Yeah, well, that's quite good. And then I, I, do, you, I, do you do Subscribestar and Patreon? I, I've, I've, I've got those, which are a nice community of people there. But again, I don't know how long these things... Well, go- I have my own thing. I have supportinglisteners.com. That's my own thing. It's just for me. So as long as I can get hosting and payment processing, then I'm fine. And, and, and does, that, does that work for you? I mean, because as you say, payment processing is, is, is one of the weak links in the chain, isn't it? Yeah, but so far, so good. I mean, I can probably figure out alternatives if it ever came to that. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd like to be paid in Bitcoin, frankly, but, but, but it's, it's amazing how few people actually have Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I've ever been paid in Bitcoin. Have you? Well, I, I have a subscription website and people will sometimes ask if they can pay in Bitcoin. So I've gotten paid for services like that. In fact, that's I did buy some Bitcoin, but most of what I have came from that and I just held it and held it and held it. Boy, was that the right thing to do. <laughs> well, yeah, hodl. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I I don't know what to think about about Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum. I've, I've I've got some because I think it seems mad not to have some. But you have to be mindful that it could just disappear at any moment. Well, ev- everything's a risk in this world, and that's what we're le- <laughs> learning about now. Is what are you? What risks are you willing to take? And um, and you know, I, I have my own strategy when it comes to crypto, but but that'll have to wait for another day. I appreciate your time because I. We've not even met before, but it's like we're best friends. No, no, no. Listen, Tom, we've we've totally got to do another podcast. We'll do it um, at my place next time. Um, I'll have you on the on the Delling Pod, and it'll be great. It'll be wonderful. But who knows? I might I might see you in Florida. I don't know how I don't know how easy it is for an English person to kind of move to Florida. I mean, if I spend a certain amount, is that is that how it works? I, uh, honestly, I don't know. I mean, I could, I could hide you in one of my rooms until they stop looking for you, and then you could go from there. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know how it works. No, um, but I'm, I'm sorely tempted because I think England is lost, sadly, because I, I think we used to be the greatest place in the world. I love, I love London. I really do, and I, I still hope I can get there and see some shows in the West End someday again. No, London's gone, but we can talk about that. London is over, but even the countryside is starting to die as well. Anyway, next time we'll talk about that. Thanks again, James. I appreciate it. All right, folks, that's our episode for today. Remember, if you want to stay sane on this whole COVID thing, I've got a list of the resources I like to consult in order to stay informed as to what's really going on. And if you'd also like that list, you can get it at tomwoods.com slash corona. So go pick that up. That's going to improve your life as the Tom Woods Show in general surely does day by day, does it not? Thanks so much for listening, everybody. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. 
Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.